Night Beat starts right now. Tonight, a large 15-foot metal cross has a new home in Uvalde. We first told you about this cross in our newscast at 5 o'clock. The man who made the cross drove it down from west of Fort Worth with the help of a motorcade. He tells the night team's Lee Waldman he knows the pain of losing a child and hopes this provides healing and comfort to the Uvalde victims' families. Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you for bringing us all together on the day that's going to be filled with emotions. We're going to have to get a bunch of hands on so it don't get squirty. We got it. Until this one gets tight. Hands on metal. People coming together. Come on up off the trailer a little bit more. To raise a cross. Brenda, Brenda. This fell out of the inside of it. Do you want it? And a community out of darkness. Anyone, any of the family needs to come because we have a gift for them. Okay. I don't know if it was my son telling me to build it or God. And I, it was like someone hit me in the head. I got goosebumps, my hair stood up on my arms, my neck, and I started crying. And I said, I got to build them a cross. He called me the next day. Dad said, I want to build a cross. He said, I don't know how we're going to do it, but I want to build a cross. After a seven hour drive, welders and cement pouring, the 15 by 12 foot cross has a permanent home flying beside the doves. I'm very proud of it for the way it looks. Other than that, it's, a, it's going to be a nightmare to me. He calls this cross his third baby. His first was for Brady, his son who died at 26 in a car accident. He dot you now before you knew what happened, but he had a kind soul. This slot is for the letters to heaven. Kids can write to their friends that they lost, knowing their words will stay safe and untouched. But I hope they're in, in a month they're having to shovel them in there because it's so full. In a town that's turned into a living memorial, growing, changing by the day, Collins believes this cross Glad it's in. made from a father mourning his own son will make an impact by making this cross and living and being by my baby's cross every day. That's what I knew that these people needed to grieve to heal. We just pray that we can continue to share our love that you've given us in our hearts to all of these families and people that are hurting. In Uvalde. We thank you for the safe travel. We thank you for all the blessings you give us. Lee Walton. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Amen. Case at 12 News. Beautiful gesture from that father. High school seniors from Uvalde will get to decide if they want to participate in graduation this year. The announcement coming from the superintendent of Uvalde CISD. Graduation is set for the Honey Bowl Stadium this coming Friday. The superintendent says the district is working with local and state law enforcement to have an increased police presence at the ceremony. Those who still choose not to attend can make arrangements to pick up their diplomas. The graduation comes just 31 days after the Robb Elementary School massacre where those 19 students and two teachers were killed. To other stories we've been following today, more than two dozen people will not be able to go home tonight after their apartment on the north side was damaged by fire. We first told you about this developing story today at 5. While everyone made it out safely, the night team's Camelia Juarez reports some people lost things you can't put a price tag on. Well, the challenges was just a sheer the amount of fire. The thick smoke could be seen from miles away. Over 30 fire trucks arrived at the Burning Tree Apartments off Jones Maltzberger Road near Thousand Oaks Drive. Hey, get out of the apartments on fire. I'm like, dude, I'm already out. According to the San Antonio Fire Chief Charles Hood, some firefighters went on defense while others used a ladder truck to gain some height and fight the flames. We made attempts for an offensive attack to the floors. Uh, fire floors. We were driven out by the rapidly deteriorating conditions. However, it was not enough to save at least 24 apartment units that were damaged, and 12 of those are uninhabitable, according to Chief Hood. Luis Sanchez, whose family were inside the apartment complex, were able to escape safely. They they was um, listening to music when the uh, fire alarm starts beeping, and they started screaming, and they get out of the apartment. The Red Cross is assisting those displaced, and although there were no injuries, several dogs were killed in the fire, including a service dog for Maxine Cole's granddaughter. He loved my granddaughter. Now my granddaughter is trying to figure out why they're gone. 
Now, the remainder of the building will likely be torn down, but investigators will find the cause of the fire first and investigators will be out here all night long investigating the scene as well as making sure that no flames reignite. Live in the north side, Camelia Juarez, KSAT 12 News. Making news around Texas tonight, health, Houston health officials are investigating their first case of monkeypox. Officials say the case is connected to a person who recently traveled internationally. However, it's unknown right now which country they visited. Officials also say the person does not need to be hospitalized and are currently isolating at home. Houston epidemiologists are working to get in touch with those in close contact with that person. This is the second monkeypox case reported here in Texas. So far, there are no cases reported here in Bear County. COVID-19 vaccine shots could be in the arms of children under five years old as early as next week. That's according to White House officials after a CDC advisory panel voted unanimously in favor of recommending both Moderna and Pfizer shots. Pfizer's vaccine is a three shot series, one tenth the size of the adult dose. The company's early data showed it was 80% effective in preventing symptomatic COVID. Moderna's vaccine is two shots, a quarter the size of the adult dose. Early data shows it was about 40 to 50% effective at preventing mild infections. These new developments have left parents with mixed reactions. I want to keep him safe from severe COVID, from hospitalization. My child already had COVID. I know his immune system has antibody response. Well, the FDA and CDC say recovering from COVID may only offer a limited amount of protection for a limited time. Vaccines increase that protection and that is why they're recommended. A couple dozen people who are currently experiencing homelessness got treated today to some extra care as part of a summer wellness fair. Take a look. It was organized by Broken Warriors Angels. They provided barbecue plates along with services like eye, dental and medical care screenings. Some of those who showed up were even given a fresh new haircut. Organizers say they know this means a lot to them, but they aspire to do even more. Because the help that we're providing here is not everything they need. And so what we're wanting to do is put a program together where we can actually bring people even further than just a one day event. The nonprofit does wellness fairs like this once a quarter, but the organizers say they hope to be able to increase that in the future. Well, Juneteenth celebrations are going on all weekend long in San Antonio. Today, the Juneteenth Festival at Comanche Park kicked off those celebrations. This morning, thousands of people gathered to celebrate Juneteenth with a parade. The celebration is even more special for organizers now that Juneteenth is officially a federal holiday. It's also the largest participation the parade has ever had. Organizers say in their inaugural year, they had just five people. I never thought it would happen in my lifetime. Somebody just asked me, say, did you expect it? I said, this is beyond expectation. Love his energy. <laughs> the community says that they are so happy with today's turnout and are hoping to be bigger and better next year. The Juneteenth Festival continues tomorrow starting at 11 a.m. along with some other holiday events. For a full list, just head to ksat.com. All right, taking you outside tonight with live cam. Uh, of course, it was another hot day. That's not going to change, but there was something a little different today. We actually had activity on radar this afternoon and this evening. Now, it wasn't anything to write home about, but I heard from a few of you on social media that said, hey, I got a little bit of rain late in the day today. And if so, you were one of the lucky ones. And I got to tell you, if you get any more tomorrow, you may want to consider playing the lottery because uh, you're really hitting a streak of luck here. Uh, 98 was our high temperature this afternoon after a morning low of 74. So when we're talking about your Sunday, yes, it is going to be hot again tomorrow, but we'll also have another opportunity for some stray pop up showers tomorrow and also for the next couple of days. I'll tell you about what's changing with our weather pattern and why these low rain chances are working into the forecast. Also coming up later on on the night beats the latest Saharan dust outlook. I'll see you in just a little bit. Still ahead on the night beat. It is a word you've heard many times right on this channel, the aquifer. But why is it so important when it comes to our water usage? We break that down in our latest episode of KSAT Explains. Plus, today is National Go Fishing Day. Several kids got to have some fun and learn some things today out of Calaveras Lake. 
And we are still a few days away from official summer, but summer travel season is already here, along with flight cancellations. The latest chaos happening at airports across the nation. That's next. Severe weather moving through the Northeast on Thursday caused a ripple effect of flight delays and cancellations that have continued into today. As ABC's Karina Mitchell reports tonight, some industry experts say one factor contributing to all those disruptions is staffing shortages at the airlines. As the busy summer travel season heats up, many travelers are having to pack their patience. The first notification said your flight's delayed. The very second text was, actually, it's canceled. Severe weather moving through the Northeast on Thursday created a ripple effect of delays and cancellation that has continued for a third day. So we've been here since 4 o'clock this morning. And this is unacceptable. We booked these flights uh, a month and a half ago. On Saturday, more than 4,000 flights delayed or canceled nationwide. All this coming as demand for travel soars past pre-pandemic levels. On Friday, the TSA screened more than 2.4 million people nationwide, the most in one day since the Sunday after Thanksgiving last year. Industry experts say staff shortages from air traffic control to cockpits is largely to blame. They don't have enough employees to be able to support the summer crush. Many airlines have already trimmed their summer flight schedules. It's very frustrating. It's to the point where it's enraging. They don't have enough pilots. They haven't trained enough pilots. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg met with airline executives earlier this week, hoping to find ways to avoid a repeat of the mass cancellation seen on Memorial Day weekend. The industry is just stretched to the breaking point, and instead of bending when something bad happens, it just snaps and falls apart. Buttigieg urging the airlines to fix the disruptions and better communicate with customers. Karina Mitchell, ABC News, New York. Somehow I managed to travel twice via airplane this week and yeah. got out unscathed. Well, good. My I have to travel this week coming up, and I'm not looking forward to it at It'll all. It'll likely I... happen to Tim. Yeah, last couple <laughs> times I've traveled, it has not been good. He has um, really bad luck with yeah, that. But... I will be sending you all of the good vibes. <laughs> Thank I know you. There, I'll need I, them. I mentioned I was in a conference. There are still people trying to get back from that conference no. in Milwaukee. Yes. Um, they're, that they should have gotten home last night and they're still trying oh, to get no. back. So it is a big old mess. So I mentioned that we had a little bit of activity on radar this afternoon and this evening. You had to look really closely, uh, but we did have a few showers and even a couple of very small non severe thunderstorms. Some showers that grew tall enough to produce a few lightning stripes. Now here are the radar estimates of some of the very small showers that came in from the southeast. We had one shower that uh, made it into western Bear County. I think this may be a little bit generous as far as how much rain actually fell. But what I wanted to show you here, some of the, the big winter today was really at Escosa County where we had a handful of these little pop up showers and non severe storms. Now they we're putting down some pretty decent rain, so it's not out of the realm of possibility that some spots did maybe pick up between a quarter and a half inch of rain. Um, but again, they were very small, few and far between, and that's the same kind of activity that we're going to see tomorrow and potentially for the next couple of afternoons. Now, the reason for this slight change We've got some more clouds in the sky and enough energy to produce those little pop ups is because the heat high has been pushed off to our northeast and it's kind of centered here uh, between Wichita, Omaha and St. Louis. So that leaves just a little bit more room in our atmosphere here in Texas for a few of those little pop ups to develop during the heat of the day. So afternoon into early evening and that heat high is going to continue to kind of bounce around just a little bit over the next couple of days. Stay centered to our northeast tomorrow, Monday and Tuesday. So that will continue to kind of leave the door open for a few of these little afternoon pop ups for your Sunday, potentially even Monday and Tuesday by Wednesday, middle back half of next week. The heat high moves back, centers itself back over Texas, and then that cuts out even the potential for a stray pop up by Wednesday and beyond next week. But for the next few afternoons, wouldn't be surprised to see a little bit of activity on radar. I don't want you to get your hopes up. Most folks will miss out, but there will be a little something on radar for the next couple of days, and it certainly won't be all we need, but at least it's a, 
little change of pace for us here. High temperatures today at the airport 98. Our average high this time of year is 93, so getting a little bit closer to some seasonal norms. 99 this afternoon in New Braunfels, 98 Uvalde, and 99 in Del Rio. I think that cloud cover lingering into the afternoon helps us out just a little bit, brings those highs down a few degrees. Currently still very warm. 88 Uvalde, 85 Pleasanton, 87 Gonzales, and 88 in New Braunfels. Pretty good breeze out there, especially along the I-35 corridor. Southeasterly winds between about 10 and 20 miles per hour. We'll have another good breeze in place tomorrow. Southeasterly winds 10 to 15 for a good portion of the day. Few clouds early in the morning. Mostly sunny by the afternoon. Another hot one highs near 100 tomorrow. But as I mentioned, we will carry the potential for one of those stray pop ups as we get into the afternoon and early evening. So through lunchtime, things will be quiet, mostly sunny skies. And then notice by about four o'clock, models are picking up on some of those little pop ups that will hang around until about the sun goes down tomorrow evening. So a few lucky yards could get a quick drink tomorrow afternoon. The rest of us. We'll have to contend with more triple digit heat. Look for a high tomorrow in Floresville around 101, 101 in Nixon, 98 Bernie, 100 Bandera and 101 in Hondo. You can figure maybe add another degree or two to the heat index during the hottest part of the day tomorrow. So a few more little pop ups not out of the question Monday and Tuesday summer finally officially begins <laughs> Tuesday morning, even though it's felt like it for a while. Uh, and then we cut off even those low rain chances back half of next week, guys. Yeah, summer has been like a month already. Yeah, no kidding. Lots of ones and zeros there. Thanks, Katie. Uh huh. All right, two well known Texas foes will face off against each other on the diamond to see who stays at the College World Series. That's right. It's Longhorns and Aggies tomorrow at 1 o'clock. We'll get you ready for the big showdown against these two rivals. And could the Deshaun Watson trade be voided? That's a good question. Coming up. Texas Aggies will face their rivals at Texas Longhorns tomorrow to decide who gets to stay at the College World Series in Omaha and who gets to go home. The Aggies suffered the first loss in Omaha on Friday afternoon when they lost a slugfest to Oklahoma 13 to 8. In that game, Bernie champions Jordan Thompson went one for two with a home run and three RBI in the defeat. In the tournament, Thompson is hitting 286, an on base percentage of 444, and a slugging percentage of 762, and is six for 21 with a double, three home runs, and nine RBI. Does facing the Longhorns give the Aggies even more motivation? in this winner go home showdown if that's what gets you going because you're an Aggie and and that's what helps you grind and win pitches that's great if, if it's playing the game and not paying attention to who's on the other side um, uh, then then that's fine too but you know for me I just want to keep playing I want to keep you know I don't care who it's against um, I haven't been around around long enough I've been a part of other teams other programs that played played Texas but at the end of the day they're playing for their season and we're playing for ours obviously on a stage like this in a situation like this there can be a lot of kind of outside distractions that come from the you know the history of the tradition but at the end of the day it's still about us going out there and and executing our game plan and and playing the game that we all know we we're capable of playing. Now on offense, the Aggies lineup is producing an average of seven and a half runs per game, 8.2 in the playoffs. It'll be interesting to see how their pitching holds up after going through six in the loss to OU on Friday. Texas Longhorns are the latest victim of the surging Fighting Irish at Notre Dame after they were able to hand the Horns a 7-3 defeat on Friday night. In that game, Bernie's Doug Hodo III provided a chance for a Longhorn rally when he was able to provide this RBI single to left and the fifth to drive in Dylan Campbell. And very similar to the Aggies' offensive stat, the Longhorns are averaging 7.9 runs per game, eight runs a game in the postseason. What did they think of their future in the College World Series coming down to a match against their in-state rivals? Learn what happened, learn from the mistakes, kind of make the adjustments and then move on. Um, tomorrow's a new day. We've, we've been in this situation in the past, and so just move on and get back to work. I'd say we just kind of look at it as just another game. I mean, I know it's, it's bigger than that, but if we go into the game thinking like, oh, this is a big game, like we don't want to get like sped up and stuff, so we just want to like take it one pitch at a time and just try to minimize as much as we can. All right, batter up is tomorrow at 1 p.m. in Omaha. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. There has been a lot of conversation about whether or not the trade of former Texas quarterback Deshaun Watson to the Cleveland Browns could be reversed in light of new information that's come out about Watson's off-the-field behavior, and the short answer is 
No. During an appearance on a Houston radio station, Texas General Manager Nick Casario, who made the deal with Cleveland for six draft picks, said, I would say that whatever trades have happened have happened in the past, and now we're just focused on training camp and moving forward with the team. Speculation began following the New York Times story that reported Watson booked massages with as many as 66 different women over the course of 19 months, and the Texans knowingly or not aided Watson by providing their quarterback, then quarterback, the access to the Houstonian and exclusive resort and spa where some of the massages occurred and a non-disclosure agreements as early as 2020. And now the Washington Post is reporting that the NFL is considering a significant suspension for violating the NFL's personal conduct policy that could include the entire upcoming season, if not more. The Browns were prepared for that at least one season, structuring his fully guaranteed contract of $230 million for just $1 million this coming season. And there's been some movement in the Browns' attempt to trade Baker Mayfield, that's after the Browns have apparently agreed to pay half of his guaranteed $19 million salary for next season, according to Sports Illustrated. That has been the biggest stumbling block for Cleveland in negotiations with the Carolina Panthers, who appear to be the only team interested at this time, and there may be more compensation given to get him out of Cleveland. Who's leading the U.S. Open? Got that for you in just a few minutes. Coming up next, Courtney and Tim. My Browns, such a beautiful disaster. The bless their hearts, <laughs> right? Beautiful bless disaster. their hearts. <laughs> All right, up next, we're talking about the aquifer in our latest Case Out Explains episode, how it utilizes rain to bring water to you. Okay, you hear about it from our weather team just about every day. The aquifer, the water levels, you know it's important. But how much do you know about the aquifer and how it functions, who regulates it, and why? Well, that's the focus of today's Case Out Explains. And for this one, we tap two members of our team who know the aquifer quite well. Meteorologists Justin Horn and Sarah Spivey, here they are for this week's Case Out Explains. The Edwards Aquifer stretches from Edwards and Kinney counties as far east as Travis County. It's comprised of three zones, the contributing zone, which can be found in the hill country, the recharge zone, and the artesian zone. Let's take another view showing you a cross section of the aquifer. When rain falls on the contributing zone, it flows down into the recharge zone. Think of all the porous limestone in Government Canyon, for example. When the rain falls directly on the recharge zone, it goes straight into the aquifer. Then pressure from all that water builds up in the artesian zone, which is where we access that water through wells. Now that's how the aquifer works today, but how it was formed goes back millions of years to a time when Texas was underwater and San Antonio was a beach. You can see evidence of this in the form of dinosaur tracks at Government Canyon, believed to have been formed either on a muddy beach or on a sandy beach. In those shallow seas, there were mollusks, clams, and other shellfish. When they died, their shells formed what is called karst, and that's what the aquifer is made of. Karst is a porous limestone. Again, these are the fossilized remains of all of those mollusks and shelly creatures. And the porous uh, nature of this is what houses the water. That's what you can see of the aquifer above ground, but it goes a lot deeper. Down in this cave in Comal County, it's like a history book of the aquifer. So at one time, the cave was filled with water. And then as the water levels have dropped over geologic time, it's left these relics uh, of conduits that move water through the system and that. And so these caves allow us to look at the fabric of the limestone to understand better how groundwater moves through the system, how it goes from recharge to discharge. This cave was probably formed millions of years ago, which brings us back to that word again, karst. Karst is a, a landscape that's characterized by sinkholes and sinking streams and caves and springs. Uh, it's also a what we call a subsurface uh, system that allows us to transport and move water through it very quickly, very rapidly. This wall is a good example of what the aquifer would look like. You see it's kind of sponge-like, it has pockets here, and the water is in these pockets and then moves through the system, eventually discharged at the springs. There are some of the caves in Bear County and, and Medina Uvalde and, and Hayes County, where we've been able to go through the cave uh, down deep enough that we've actually seen the Edwards Aquifer itself. Like many caves in the Texas Hill Country, this has a lot of tight spaces that we've been crawling through, but it opens up into bigger rooms like this one. Past that, we come face to face with this guy, a tricolor bat. 
but it's species that live in the aquifer itself that led this natural wonder to be regulated by modern day government. The beginning really stems from a lot of conflict and controversy over what to do about this resource. In the 80s, San Antonio was a rapidly growing city and there was a concern. Was there enough water for everyone? Then, much like now, there really weren't that many laws uh, dictating how you could limit groundwater withdrawals. And so the Sierra Club in the 90s brought an endangered species suit, uh, which was sort of the only way to, to go about something like that. Perhaps the most well-known of those endangered species, the Texas blind salamander. Today, it is the poster child for aquifer conservation efforts, but it took several big steps to protect these tiny creatures, the first of which was a court ruling. The judge said, look, Texas, you either need to manage this or the federal government and me are gonna come in and do it. And so the legislature has never moved so fast, I don't think, in the history of Texas because we got the Edwards Aquifer Authority. And we have a three-pronged mission. Three words, manage, enhance, and protect the Edwards Aquifer system. The EAA is funded by permit fees. Those are fees paid by groups that pump water from the aquifer, SAWS being the group that pumps the most. You hear us report the aquifer level every day, and from time to time, SAWS does implement water restrictions, but that's not to keep the aquifer from running dry. Yeah, that actually won't happen in our lifetime. The reason that we have those in place is to keep the springs flowing in order to protect endangered species like the Texas blind salamander. It's one of 11 threatened, endangered, or petitioned to be endangered species that live in the springs of the aquifer. So we have, you know, three salamanders on there. We have fish species. We have Texas wild rice as a plant, and then we have a number of macro invertebrates. These biologists have the tedious but important task of leaving no stone unturned, literally to count Comal salamanders in New Braunfels. The flags show where they've spotted them. A lot of people are very surprised that the limits that we have on watering are actually for these tiny little critters. In 2013, the culmination was an agreement among the five permittees, the city of San Marcos, the city of San Antonio through SAWS, the city of New Braunfels, Texas State University, and the Edwards Aquifer Authority. Those five entities agreed to start the habitat conservation plan. That plan is why these counts happen. This is like a bigger one here. If these creatures are healthy and thriving, it's a sign that the aquifer is too. The Texas blind salamander is considered so important, there's even a backup population just in case. And the idea here is that if something catastrophic were to happen to the aquifer itself or the rivers that are fed, like the San Marcos River, we would have a population on station. At the San Marcos Aquatic Resources Center, scientists feed and breed the Texas blind salamander and try to learn more about them. It's hard to know how big the population really is because they live deep underground in a pitch black aquifer that spans miles. But researchers do know this. They have very permeable skin. Like if, if there's some contaminant in the water, it's gonna permeate them too, right? Uh, unlike us who have like very tough skin, who are very resistant to environmental changes, they're super sensitive to environmental changes. In the end, the researchers and scientists who work with the aquifer believe conservation efforts to protect these species benefits all of us. And as San Antonio and surrounding cities keep growing, that work becomes even more crucial. I think that the biggest challenge moving forward is, is making sure, as I've said, that the aquifer remains sustainable in the face of a number of different potential risks or threats. Uh, climate change being one, but beyond that, uh, what what is happening in the region as a result of the development? As growth continues, for example, into the into the hill country, which is the catchment area for the for the Edwards, that's where all the water comes from that gets into the Edwards. What does that mean for us in terms of recharge to the Edwards? Is there a threat that the quality of water that gets into the aquifer is going to be compromised at some point? Still ahead on the night beat, the community is coming together to give some local kids the fishing experience of the summer. Why the annual Kids Fish Day event returns year after year.
Well, today is National Go Fishing Day, which lined up perfectly with the 23rd annual Kids Fish Day. Dozens of kids were in attendance at Calaveras Lake. They were given fishing poles and tackle boxes in order to catch up to 500 catfish donated by Texas Parks and Wildlife. This is the first year the event has returned since the COVID pandemic. It's put on by CPS Energy as a way to provide a positive, fun experience for kids in the community. We're a community serving business. I can't think of a better way to reach out and touch our community than events like this where we bring kids in and let them fish maybe for the first time in their lives, experience something they've never done before. And some of the kids walked away with big awards for the biggest fish and most catches for both boys and girls. Looks like they had some shade out there for them too. A yeah. little bit, finally, with just some clouds hanging around. Yeah, that was nice to see some clouds today. It was nice, and even a little bit of rain out of a few of those clouds. A few lucky yards uh, got a little pop-up shower uh, this afternoon. Hi, Courtney. Hi, Courtney. Hi, everybody. Always happy to look at your. <laughs> face. I won't be doing the weather, but I'll give you a well, smile. Uh, <laughs> oh, here we go. Woo! Long time. Hey, hey, girl. Right around the studio. Taking my camera time. <laughs> the cameras were drinking some of that mm. shiner. I, yeah. Um, anyway, I was going to talk about fishing <laughs> tomorrow, but um, technical difficulties. It's going to be hot again tomorrow. <laughs> Pop-up shower or storm. We'll talk more about it coming up. <laughs> that was a win. So you were going to tell us the fishing forecast before I, they thought I was a meteorologist, which yeah. I am not. I mean, you would you could just say it's going to be hot, and that would check. You it know what? Out. I could have done it. Yeah, the fish will be cool though. They're they're in the water. Yeah, yeah good for good for them. Good for um, them. <laughs> must be nice. Uh, so we'll go from a fishing forecast to an outdoor pool forecast. Maybe uh, you're going to be treating Dad tomorrow to some. Uh, grilling time or time outside. Uh, it's going to be another toasty one tomorrow, so pool would be a good place to be. Look for a high around 100. And then we do have those uh, low, low chances of a pop up shower uh, or non severe storm tomorrow afternoon. I've got another look at future casts for you coming up here in just a minute. Quick check of what's going on in the tropics. Uh, pretty quiet out there. No new tropical development, no new disturbances expected over the next two to five days. Part of the reason for that, we've had the plumes of Saharan dust moving across the Atlantic. Now, typically when uh, that dust is out there, it suppresses tropical development because this air is so dry. Tropical systems uh, don't really like that. So with these plumes coming across, no big surprise that things are pretty quiet out in the Atlantic Basin. Now, earlier this week, we had some more dense dust around Texas. A lot of it has thinned out, but there are still some plumes out across parts of the Caribbean and into the Atlantic. But it does look like by the time they get to Texas middle part of next week, uh, the concentration of the dust is going to be on the lighter side. So we're really not looking at any of those big plumes of dense dust working back into the state for the next week or so. So a little bit of good news there. I know folks really don't enjoy when that dust is around because it can cause allergy like symptoms for some folks. So for the next few days, very light concentrations of that dust. I don't think it'll be until Wednesday, Thursday next week um, that the concentration starts to increase just a little bit with a few of those plumes moving in. But even then, light dust concentrations middle and back half of next week. So uh, a little bit of a break for us here as far as the Saharan dust is concerned. Very warm out there right now. 88, mostly clear skies and a good breeze out of the southeast at around 20 miles per hour here in San Antonio. 83 down in Pleasanton, 82 Kennedy, 87 in Austin and 85 in Kerrville, 86 in Converse right now, 82 Bernie stage. So still really warm out there on the humid side, but a lot of spots, especially along the I-35 corridor, have a good breeze right now. We do have calm winds from Bandera up to Comfort, but everyone else, uh, a good breeze has settled in tonight. As we head through the overnight hours, a few clouds will build in while we're sleeping, such that it'll be partly to mostly cloudy early tomorrow morning. And then those clouds will pretty quickly go away. Mostly sunny skies heading into the afternoon. As we get closer to about four or five o'clock, that's when I'll turn my attention to the radar and see if we've got any pop up showers or non severe storms out there. As you can see from this future cast model coverage of any rain tomorrow, just like today is going to be very, very low. So don't get your hopes up, but a few little pop ups not out of the question late in the afternoon tomorrow through about sunset. 
Once the sun goes down and we lose the heat of the day, anything that's out there will quickly go away. And again, just don't get too excited about these low rain chances over the next few days over the next week. For a lot of us, little to no rain is expected. A few lucky yards could get around a tenth of an inch of rain and uh, we need rain in a big way here. It has been 136 days since early February that we've gotten more than an inch of rain or at least an inch of rain at the airport in San Antonio. So I wish I had better news for you in the days ahead, but unfortunately tomorrow also into Monday and Tuesday, our rain chance only around 10% guys. See, I couldn't have done that. Nope. I'm no Katie Blake. <laughs> Stop. I could have just said it's going to be hot. It's hot. Sports. Back to you. <laughs> All right, Greg, uh, NFL has been handing out fines like speeding tickets in the offseason. Yeah, that's pretty much what they amount to, although they're a very big speeding ticket when we come back. It's not just Mike McCarthy who's committing to sin, and so is Lovey Smith of the Houston Texans. will tell you how much lighter he is in the wallet and who's leading the U.S. Open after one of the big names cratered today. Coming up. Pro football coverage powered by Davis Law Firm. The next time the Dallas Cowboys are on the field together officially will be next month when they report to their training camp in Oxnard, California on July 25th. The Cowboys will be looking to build on their 12 and 5 finish from last season by going deeper in the playoffs in just a one and done postseason, as is the case against the San Francisco 49ers. One thing that will help the Cowboys jumpstart 2022 is the health of star quarterback Dak Prescott, who had to throttle back his scrambling and called runs for first downs and easing back after the worst injury of his career. Double compound fracture and dislocation of his right ankle in week five of the 2020 season. For the first time since that moment, there are no restrictions on what Prescott can do this offseason. I go into each offseason um, trying, trying to be a better player and person than I was the, the year before. And so I, at this stage, at this point, I definitely feel like I've accomplished that. I think I'm far, um, so, so much further along than I was last year at this time. I mean, just being able to get the team reps, as you said, being able to move more, um, take care of my whole body and just focus on everything and not just my leg. Uh, it's a huge difference. My confidence is through the roof. I mean, uh, I feel good on the move or not. So, I mean, uh, to say that on the move is my best, I mean, I feel like I can make every throw from on the move. While Dak is about to start his seventh season in Dallas, this will be only the second for Davis Mills, the quarterback of the Houston Texans, starting 11 of his 13 games he played in as a rookie, including the final five, where he's able to win two games out of the four that Texans could only scrape up for the second season in a row. Now, one of the things that Texans have done to help Mills' development is promoting Pep Hamilton from quarterback's coach and passing game coordinator to offensive coordinator. What does Mills have to say about that? I like him a lot. Um, he's been coaching co the quarterback position for years now, so he, he really understands what we see back there and um, how we can react to things and how we can progress towards or forward after bad plays. So um, it feels like, I mean, we've only been together for a year now, but he's known about me since before I was even at Stanford, so we have a really good connection in that regard. And, I mean, we feel like we're on a really good uh, similar page with a lot of things, so we're excited how everything's moving. And General Manager Nick Casario made sure he had at least one major veteran target to throw to in Brandon Cooks by extending Cooks' contract for two years, $40 million, and through the draft by bringing in John Metchie the third, a wide receiver out of Alabama with a second-round pick. Turns out Cowboys coach Mike McCarthy is not the only NFL coach in the state of Texas being fined for violating the NFL's collective bargaining agreement with the players. So has Texans head coach Lovey Smith. Smith has been fined $50,000 for ordering one-on-one -on -one contact drills between the offensive and defensive linemen. Teams are not supposed to conduct live contact drills during the offseason. That's after Mike McCarthy was fined a second time this offseason for allowing that to happen during his organized team activities. And since it was his second time in as many offseasons, he was hit with a $100,000 fine following 50000 last year's Moving day on the round three of the U.S. Open, the country club in Brookline, Massachusetts, American Will Salatoris made a great surge today. Here with a perfect approach shot of the par 415. Watch it stick right on the green just a few feet away from the cup. He would sink the birdie putt and moved to four under overall with a 367 on the day. John Rahm held the lead at five under for most of the day, but Rahm cratered down the stretch. On the 18th, he hits his second shot in the bunker. Rahm would end up double bogeying that final hole to finish at three under overall with one over round. Here's a look at the latest leaderboard going into tomorrow's final round. Here you see Will Salatoris at four under. Ty Webb, Mike Fitzpatrick, Rahm has dropped now to three under overall. It's been a tough course to play, but when he hit it into that bunker, guess what happened? He tried to get it up over a high lip and it came right back to him. Yeah, that We've all done that. Yeah, just not at a level, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Looks worse when he does it. That's no money on the line when it happens to us. <laughs> right. Thanks, Greg. We'll be right back.
That's it. That's the whole show. Thanks for watching. <laughs> we'll catch you tomorrow.